before we get into this episode, there's a trigger warning. Um, we wanted to give you a heads up that we will be discussing sexual assault content that happened between two of the OC characters in the previous episode. We want to be sensitive to the subject matter. So if you want to skip forward in time, please check our show notes for when to skip to. Help is always available for anyone struggling with the trauma of sexual assault. Rain is the nation's largest anti-sexual violence organization and offers help to survivors. If you need to speak to someone, you can call their hotline at 1-800-656-HOPE. Welcome to the OC Bitches. Welcome to the OC Bitches. Today we are season two, episode 24, the dearly beloved... The finale of season two. Can you believe we're here? No. <laughs> <laughs> so we're super excited. Our guest today is an incredibly talented actor, writer, and director, and probably more than that, Logan Marshall Green. Logan grew up in the theater and is an MFA graduate of NYU Tisch School of the Arts. When he's not doing theater, he's acting in films such as Ridley Scott's Prometheus, Spider-Man Homecoming, and the upcoming Netflix film, Lou, produced by J.J. Abrams with Allison Janney and... Say that, say that for me correctly. Journey? Uh, journey Smollett. Journey, okay, Journey the, Smollett. The journey I, I wanted to make sure I said that correctly, sorry. Mm. TV shows such as Dark Blue Quarry, and currently he can be seen in Big Sky. He also wrote and directed his first feature, Adopt a Highway Star in Ethan Hawk, released in 2019. You all know him as Trey, Brian's bad news brother on the OC. Please welcome <laughs> Logan. Did I get all that right? Did You're you get that right? Busy man. <laughs> I, I, I've been busy, I suppose. Not anymore, though. Here I am. Um, <laughs> no, thanks for having me. This is amazing. It's a trip, actually. Oh, yeah. Does this look familiar at all? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of my point of view from that, that pool house. Yeah. <laughs> Staring out into the abyss. Right. Yeah. right. It's so funny because when we first talked about, you know, ho hoping and wanting you to come on, I was like, he's too busy. There's no way we're going to get Logan in here. <laughs> like, there's no way he's going to be able to do it. He's too busy and come and talk to us. And you know what? Here you are. So I'm shocked and very flattered and honored <laughs> that you're willing to be here with us. So. I'm, I'm excited <laughs> to be here. And I mean, I'm not busy as much as I am just covered in kids and a dad and you know i just yeah. dropped them off and came out here yeah but, uh, that's the busiest though a parent there's nothing busier it's true i don't yeah. care what people say it's literally the hardest job and the most busy you will ever be in your life no no doubt <laughs> just to wait until you send him away to college it gets it's, it's good now <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> it's it very unbusy like she's so. a, she's adulting in a different city yeah, I mean, he's like looking at me like uh i don't know what you're oh saying no about. no no <laughs> trust me those years were you know yeah it, it's it's sorry it's sorry to tell you it's gonna get a little harder so anyway <laughs> mm -hmm. but listen yeah. before we get into the episode well, you know, we take this opportunity on the podcast to really get to know our guests. And it, I had so much fun reading about your your background. And you come from a family of theater teachers and directors. And and tell us about that a little bit. Yeah, I, I grew up uh, around the stage. I was a little theater brat. My mom and dad met doing theater. It's kind of scandalous, <laughs> scandalously my dad taught my mom. Uh -oh. Um, uh -oh. <laughs> and they met doing a, a Tennessee Williams place one of my boys named Tennessee. And um, I love that name. Yeah. So Thanks. And you know, I grew up around the wings, you know, and um around theater in general. And so I never actually kind of thought I would reach TV and and film that always kind of felt like a, a lottery win. And so I only kind of focused on theater because that's all I knew. But I, I have a real love and respect for it and something that I really sought, especially in the first part of my, my career. Um, to, I love live performance. Um, there's something about it still that you just can't compete with those moments. You know? So theater in general, you knew every bit of it. It wasn't just a destiny. You weren't just destined to be an actor. You, you, were, you were drawn to all different crafts of the theater. No doubt. In fact, I didn't. I didn't think I was going to be an actor in the theater. I thought I was going to be a lighting designer. Yeah. Um, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, it was only. I and you have to do a lot of electives. In fact, I was just watching Fiddler on the Roof um, <laughs> with my mom. Oh my god, that's so cute. And I, 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 the first job in the theater I ever had was doing quick changes side stage um, right. of Tevye <laughs> and Fiddler. <laughs> and of course, I don't remember much of it. But you know, things like costume changes and holding spot ops, I, I suddenly was getting different 
perspectives and, and angles on the stage and what it means. And, you know, it wasn't until uh, there was a, it was, a, I was at University of Tennessee um, that I was watching a Three Tall Women, Edward Albee's Three Tall Women. And, you know, it's really about three women all in different stages of one woman's life. And their father is on the bed. He's the Edward Albee, you know, figure. And the, the actor only had to lie there. You only have to lie there. But even lying there, he was indicating that he was asleep. And I, and for some reason, it was irking me in a way that it was drawing me to like, I can do that. You know what I mean? I can, at the very least, I can lie on stage better than this guy. <laughs> right. Um, Indication is the, uh, is the lowest form of acting. No doubt. And as, right. if I can see that all the way up at the spot, <laughs> um, I can, you know, I just saw, I just decided that I would take my junior off and take it serious. And I went to the National Theater Institute. Um, my mom really afforded me opportunities in the theater, guided me towards Williamstown, towards National Theater Institute. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot, uh, a lot, you know, to a lot of my success started with just my mom's guidance. Um, so. And she teaches and, at Brown still? She does. And she's actually retired now. She okay. retired about seven years ago, I'd say. Oh, wow. Yeah, but she was the big woman on campus there. You yeah. know, everybody was funneled through Professor Marshall's class, whether you were business, she turned businessmen and, <laughs> and lawyers into actors. And, right. um, and yeah, she's taught an incredible amount of, of incredible actors and actresses out there. It must have been so cool to grow up around that and having someone like that sort of mentor you. And yeah, we we also, you know, I have a twin brother. We put her through hell, too. Because you have we, a twin brother? I do. Yeah. Like identical? Well, I guess you have to be, right? If the same sex. Well, no, no. We're fraternal, no. actually. Um, oh, just kidding. But we look a lot alike. Okay. Um, and, um, but we, you know, we really rebelled against the theater at first. I'm not going to sit here and say we were in drama club, but we weren't. We were in sports. In fact, I remember... I think it was, I don't know if it was me or my brother kicking um, Diana Ross in the, in the head <laughs> during, <laughs> accidentally as we were fighting sure, behind sure. her during, you know, my mom taught her kids. And I, that was kind of, um, that was one of my mom's most angry moments. <laughs> <laughs> but you could use that later on in your acting. Oh, yeah. I pulled from that moment all the time when I need shame, when I need That's where having you go accidentally to. kicked <laughs> Diana Ross in the head. Embarrassed my mom. So was TV and film, you, you said it wasn't necessarily, I mean, obviously it wasn't always part of the plan, but how did that happen? Mm -hmm. Well, I went to NYU. I got, I was, again, very fortunate. I, um, I kind of went after the top programs and I got really, really, well, I'll just say lucky because there's so many people, um, you know, who try out for these programs. And mm -hmm. I was really fortunate to go to NYU during a time um, uh, at its height. And so... You know, I was, and, and I, at Williamstown, I had gotten representation at the same time, but I told them I'm finishing school. Mm -hmm. um, but there was definitely uh, a couple of jobs that were starting to pull me out. And before I'd even, you know, finished school, I had already had, you know, again, I was very fortunate to have reps because I didn't have to, you know, the showcases, you're really trying to kind of dance for your food and, 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 and find those, those men and women who can represent you. And um, so I came out with a little bit of a leg up and I had actually turned down a big job. Really? Um, it, yeah. In fact, um, you know, to this day, I, I wonder <laughs> if it was a, a wise move or not, but, uh, you know, there was a, a very massive move. What that, was it? Uh, so? Yeah, I guess I can. Um, <laughs> I know. I'm like, are you going to say it? I mean, it was, it was Terminator 3. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, that makes sense. And, you know, Jonathan Mostow, the director, was incredible. And he, you know, it, it really pursued me. Um, but, but academia is big in your family and it was important to you. Absolutely. The MFA. And I knew what I wanted to do was, was act on stage. And I, and I knew that was going to separate me, you know, on that resume from others because the theater scene is very small and it's, and it's tough. There are some amazing actors I knew I was going to be up against. Um, and there was a whole crew of actors that I already looked up to be, you know, it's this like off Broadway, Broadway crew, like Sam Rockwell, Peter Dinklage, mm -hmm. Billy Crudup, John Ellison Conley, you know, uh, just these, this, you know, this like, rebel crew of actors and so i also had this crew of like 17 students that i'd just been in boot camp with for three years and i didn't want to i didn't want to abandon that you know it, uh, ensemble was paramount for me so wow. i stuck it up in fact i mean you were still doing theater right before the oc and like right after right you like jumped yes. right back into it right 
Yes, I mean, I get me out of here. I got to go back to (laughs) winning. Well, kind of. I mean, I was actually, you know, funny enough, I was I had just done a play. Yes, a Neil LeBue play. It was my first production. Um, In fact, I think I was being I remember correctly during this episode, I had gotten broken up with by um, uh, an an actress that I had a showmance with. um, (laughs) Oh, the old showmance. (laughs) Yeah. And um, but I was actually doing. 24 at the same time. Oh, that's right. Oh, so that wow. was your first. <clears throat> yes. Was that your first um, role on Touch? No, my first role was an SUV. Uh, SUV. SVU. <laughs> SVU. SVU. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt they moved me around in an SUV. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but, you know, throughout, I only did about eight episodes on VOC and I, I did about eight episodes on 24. And so I would, I remember, you know, finishing uh, down in Manhattan Beach and get being picked up by another Fox SUV and being <laughs> driven to DeSoto where they would torture me, where Jack Bauer would torture me. Oh, wow. And then turn around sometimes and come right back, wow. you know, on a turnaround and, and have no, but it was so fun and, um, but it was exhausting. And I, mm. I definitely quickly ran back to, because that's where I was based is New York um, right. and, and continued to get on the stage. Mm. So did, so what ultimately brought you to LA? or just Hollywood um, in general? Was it your, was it 24? No, it's bed bugs. Bed bugs. Yeah. Bed I had bed literal bugs. Bed bugs. <laughs> literal bed bugs. <laughs> you were like, what project is that? Yeah. I was like, uh-huh. Yeah. I did. See, you see, I, yeah. oh, I, no. was, I was like, I'm with you. I'm like, wait, wait. <laughs> oh, it's a project. Um, no, I had gotten them once and then I got them twice. And I said, I'm not going to do this anymore. Uh. I, it was mentally exhausting, not just physically, <laughs> but I don't know if anyone in New York has ever had bed bugs. I'm sure there are many because it's like the island of the damned. Yeah. Um, and I lived in the East Village, which was the heart of the damned. And <laughs> I just was done with, I don't know, I, I had been there for about 12 years and I just, I had gotten a job as well at the same time. I was seeing somebody who lived out here and mm-hmm. I just decided to come out and I started a family soon after that. Um, mm-hmm. I'm so glad I did. I love New York. It's my favorite place in the world, but I just don't, I can't imagine raising kids yeah. here. Kids, I, know. I, I know many do, but not me. I'm not made out of them. Too. Yeah, I always wonder that myself. I'm just like, just the amount of shit you have to like pack into a taxi with kids. <laughs> like, D- down stairs. I mean, stairs and the whole, I don't know, holding and... the stroller. And, and like like a, allowing everything. your kids to take off on the subway at 12. Although Ben, yeah. I don't know, does Ben live in the city Absolutely. With He's yeah. been doing it for many years. So you are still good friends with Ben, of mm-hmm. course. You guys, yeah. and you met on the show. Did you know him before the OC? I knew him before the OC. You did? Oh, yeah. In fact, he was one of the reasons I kind of was like, you know, I want to want to jump in and play this guy's brother. Um, we weren't like great friends, like best friends. We, we I mean, we didn't become best friends, but became very close um, afterwards. But in fact, we were in a, um, a play together and <laughs> he was a tree. And <laughs> I believe he had to walk on stilts. Really? <laughs> oh my God, what I would do. Yeah, we were in this free, the free play of Williamstown mm-hmm. called Bluebird, very fantastical play. Um, but I just, I, I knew him well enough to know, like, we, that would be a great dynamic to play brothers. We had Patrick Rush on, and he he talked about casting you. And when they when they knew they were going to re, um, recast or have Trey come in, they wanted somebody that you know was correct for this role and this very impactful role and he had his eye on you and he said he thought very very lucky to get you Mm -hmm. so did they offer or did they have you read no i read i remember reading with ben wow Mm -hmm. i came into manhattan read with ben it felt right though yeah um and you know funny enough i would actually meet bradley striker who originated the role um he he did uh, he and i did a a, he came onto a a show i i was shooting and I didn't put it together. I think he put it together for me. Um, but he's a great guy. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I was also like, like why'd oh. you guys let this guy go? He's terrific. Um, <laughs> it so. was like that awkward, like, oh, I want things to do. No, no. He brought it, I, he brought it to my yeah. attention. Um, and it was a head scratch because he's super, he's a great actor. Yeah. But you guys, I mean, you and Ben, like the whole, the chemistry, everything, it was just, watching you on screen, I sound like such a fan group. <laughs> but like watching you on screen is just like you're so captivating, you know, and like how you put the it, it's like the subtleties in your expressions. And obviously, when we get to the famous, the infamous scene in mm-hmm. this episode, just like your face is just it's so interesting to watch. And like I said before we were recording, like I haven't watched these episodes. So seeing you, I'm like, 
well, Jesus Christ, you know, like it's just so clear that you were the perfect person to play this role. Thanks so much. Yeah. And and just age wise, yeah, there was something that, you know, you are just maybe what, one or two years older than Ben in real life. And just this there was it's such an interesting dynamic between the the brothers and we were we were noticing in this um throughout your storyline you did nine episodes by the way but <laughs> <laughs> but that he you know he was we josh and and company and the writers they were mirroring in so many ways what happened to ryan you know how he got out of jail how he got juvie and the discovery of the cohen's and 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 but how it's a slightly different thing and and that Trey had this opportunity to kind of go into what Ryan was experiencing, but ultimately we know that he wasn't able to kind of grasp onto that. And maybe he was just he got too much of his dad's stuff, I guess. Mm. <laughs> but it was um, but it was just a real um, it just made this show so much richer and and textured and so dimensional with your character. Yeah, I, I always felt that about and then I think. And I have that relationship. I mean, I'm older than Ben, but there's kind of a, I defer a lot of my status to Ben. He's a super smart guy. And, you know, he and I even were producing something together, but oh. I would definitely say he's, he's the, the adult in the room when it came to, <laughs> you know, understanding how to produce something. Um, I'm more the dreamer, um, <laughs> I'd say in many ways. And not that he doesn't have all those qualities too, but I definitely, there's a deferment of status, you know, with Trey to his brother and to this, world that he finds himself in um and but yet there's this ego that right. lizard brain mm -hmm. I, I i at least i it looked like i, I was bringing some lizard brain to it so. <laughs> i see this all the time but when did applying makeup become like a 30-step process if you're like me and you are ready to ditch that mountain of makeup and simplify your routine then it's time to get back to the essentials like i did with merit i love it i love it i love it Mm -hmm. Because it's everyday makeup. It's literally makeup that just enhances your features for that almost no makeup look. This cheek color that I'm wearing right now, it's cheeky. That's the name of it. And it is the best. And then I put it on my lips too, like you told me to do. <laughs> <laughs> Merit believes in accessible luxury. Their products are created from the highest quality that are priced fairly because they are 30% less than its competitors. Merit also offers a wide variety of shades for skin tones and even has a team who can help you find your perfect match. Upgrade your makeup routine with Merit. Head to meritbeauty.com slash the OC to get their free signature reusable makeup bag with your purchase. That's M-E-R-I-T beauty.com slash the OC for their free signature reusable makeup bag. Making hydration a priority helps us feel better on a day-to-day -day basis. That's why I love Liquid IV. So we do a lot of outdoor adventures like rafting and hiking, kayaking, camping. And it's really important to stay hydrated when you're out spending the night under the stars day in <laughs> and day out. <laughs> so I always make sure that we have some Liquid IV on hand. One stick of liquid IV in 16 ounces of water hydrates faster and more efficiently than water alone. And it comes in refreshing flavors like watermelon, lemon lime, strawberry, pina colada, and more. I am a huge fan of this. Now, my daughter's in Girl Scouts. And let me tell you, I have so many outdoor hikes planned for the summer. <laughs> what will I have with me? Liquid IV, because it's going to be hot and we're going to be thirsty. I love the lemon ginger. Grab Liquid IV in bulk nationwide at Costco, or you can get 25% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use code OC at checkout. That's 25% off anything you order when you use promo code OC at liquidiv.com. Experience better hydration today at liquidiv.com, promo code OC. <laughs> but, you know, I did want to, you were talking about producing, but you also write and direct. Mm -hmm. And uh, your first feature was Adopt a Highway in 2019 with Ethan Hawke. And are you doing more? I am. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't have anything in the pipe at the moment. I'm kind of taking my time and writing a lot. Um, I've got a lot of projects that I'm kind of honing. And, but... Um, you know, that that project came out of becoming a dad. 
So I, I, I don't want to, I didn't want to, I, I definitely was told, what else do you have? That's always the next thing mm -hmm. when, you, when you find, when they find something good, what else do you have? And, right. Um, I was told to really slow down and, and take my time. And, uh, but that, that came out of being a father, being lost as a father. I, you know, became kind of a father overnight in many ways. Um, and, you know, I, I just want it, I just want the writing to always feel authentic and, um, and come from a real honest place. And so I just, I've been really, I'm not in a hurry, um, cause also I love acting and, um, but I definitely will have some more projects for you guys to watch in the future. Yeah. For sure. So Thanks sorry to that for sure. Yeah. Thanks. Um, do you have any memories of like being on the OC or your first days there or what it was like, or who was like, what? <laughs> I, I definitely felt, you know, I was watching this episode, um, and I definitely felt like Trey. I won't lie. Like I kind of used the energies that were around me. I, I felt like I had walked into something much bigger than myself um, that had a whole life of its own and relationships that I didn't have a part in. I felt like an outsider mm -hmm. in many ways. And it, that all felt right. Um, so I just kind of leaned into that. That's the energy that I remember. Now, when I was watching, the episode I, I didn't remember any of the shooting any of the scenes oh, really i do remember ian the director who I, who I remember loving oh mm -hmm. yes everyone loves ian. well didn't he do 24 as well maybe he wasn't on it at the time i don't think he directed me in it yeah. but he may very well have yeah. bounced back i just remember smoking cigarettes out uh out, out, front. out, out front with him <laughs> and talking about the role and i remember bumming cigarettes off of a poor you know a base camp PA and just one day Sean. he turned to me and he just said, can you just buy a pack of cigarettes? <laughs> um, but Ian would bum them off me. So, um, but I just remember really loving him as yes. a director He's and wonderful. feeling like I was safe to be unsafe in his, on his set. Right. Mm -hmm. And being a guest star always feels like an outsider, um, you know, and, and you're feeling, especially in a show that was at that point was so huge. And were you aware of that show before you came on? at all or was it kind of it wasn't in your radar i don't think i was aware of how big it was we're only kind of discovering that doing this podcast <laughs> yeah I, I think i definitely discovered it you know zeitgeist yeah. if you will mm -hmm. when the snl skit came out uh oh you know, <laughs> that's really i was like wait a minute this has <laughs> got to be something bigger than i gave it credit because right. why would they get this kind of attention right right um, yeah, we, we were going to talk about that. We'll get into we'll that. that. Get, well, we'll you know, save, okay, we'll we actually it. have a couple. Um, so we've got we've, we've got, got some things planned. So we asked people to like call in with questions for our guests, and you had the most call-ins and voicemails that we've ever had. So we have wow. like quite a few, but we thought we'd break it up. So we were going to play two. Now. We're going to get a couple questions if before. I would love that. Yeah. yeah. Hello, this is Ashley calling from New York City. Longtime OC obsessed fan since day one. I uh, think I've seen every episode now a hundred times over. Um, Mindy and Rachel, thank you first off for doing this podcast. It is amazing. Um, reliving episode by episode with you two and having these amazing guests speak on it has just been incredible um, and just shows after how after all these years, the show is still just as amazing as it was way back when. Uh, so thank you. Um, my question is for Logan. Um, you know, I think you were arguably one of the most controversial characters in the series up until this point. You had a unique way of having the audience root for you and sometimes and then other times angry and hateful towards you um, with your decision making. Um, and that was a balance that I'm sure you had to make as an actor. How did you prepare for this role? How did you feel being this really, um, you know, monumental figure in the show um, and really setting the scene for the rest of the series with just, you know, these few moments, especially the moment with when Marissa shoots you? Um, how did you, you know, prepare for all of that? Um, and just the final comment, I think everyone that's a fan of this show can agree that your face when Marissa shoots you will forever be burned into our memory as part of this show. That was by far one of the most chilling um, and just insane moments in TV that I've ever experienced. So um, thank you guys. Wow. 
Wow. <laughs> thank you. That's an incredible, uh, uh, there's some incredible words and great questions. Um, I, I can't say I really prepped uh, for the role as much as tried to stay, like we were just speaking about, try to stay in the energy, which you know, kind of naturally came into something much bigger than myself um, in a world where people had their own relationships already made. And just, I, I you know, when you walk on that set, it, it really is this uh, built. There's a pool built. You guys know, I don't need to tell you, but certainly those <laughs> who haven't ever stepped foot on that set, it's, it was a phenomenal set to walk into that soundstage. Uh, one of my first ever sound stages, certainly the biggest set I had ever been, I've been on. And amongst um, someone who I was familiar with, and Ben, but then there was no one that I was familiar with. And I just kind of used that. Uh, so I just had tried to stay authentic to um, the fact that I was already deferring status to this process. Um, and I think that worked for Trey. And, you know, I don't, um, I don't really like to view, maybe this sounds cliche, but I don't really like to view my roles as bad guy or good guy. I just, they're, I think everyone's misunderstood in the end. Um, and if you, you can lean, obviously, a percentage of good or bad into it. But for me, I like misunderstood guys. Um, and I like, um, I like falling on my face as an actor or as a character. But I, you know, I love picking, finding ways to pick those men up or those men child up. that's what Trey really was, was a man child. And, 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 and showing you the flaws, you know, and like showing you my wrists. And, um, and so that's kind of how I how I, I envisioned Trey. And, and, you know, the final scene was certainly found in the moment with Ian, the director, and myself. You know, I think as written, she shoots him and Trey falls dead. But I just felt like it needed closure on that relationship that had gone so awry, mm -hmm. um, given these bad choices he made. And, um, so it felt like there needed to be somewhat of a goodbye to Marissa. Uh, the, the, it was just not as just as much a, a brotherly fight as it was mm. putting some closure. So I remember asking if I could just turn around and mm -hmm. just take her in, and Ian loved it. And um, yeah, that's kind of what what happened. I remember there was a shot though that they wanted, you know, this blood. Uh -huh. I remember, and I understood that as as a, as a. Um, an image a gesture mm -hmm. theatrical gesture and so that was the only thing i think that was really written was that the image and heat would play and this blood would saturate i remember it's the, slow the, motion I, yeah, I remember the thermal being very important um wardrobe piece for that you know right. and and that was again i was learning on the fly there i was mm -hmm. understanding why wardrobe is so important why you know why these gestures are so important and i couldn't understand it and of course the music a part of it until later right that's that's I mean, you never play a, an actor, at least for myself, you never play a villain as a villain. Villains don't think that they're bad. You know, we're not arch, although Jess is Jess fits the mold. Yeah, she's, the <laughs> she's just I the arch want, villain. But I do want to comment. And I know we can get into this more and I know whatever. But um, watching all of these back. When you're saying like misunderstood, I actually find myself, I mean, not siding with Trey in a, a lot of the stuff, but watching how Marissa interacts with you. And seeing how it can be misconstrued and like I'm not saying you know you should have attacked her, but like just just understanding more the misunderstanding in this person and and we we kind of argue as we're watching and we're like, well, what is she doing? You know, and we we bring that up a lot. Um I'm not it sounds like I'm condoning what happens and I'm not, but it's just that that this misunderstood character, and you know that in Trey there is something, you know, good. There is good. I think in everybody uh, and it's just interesting watching it back and kind of like going through it all and just seeing how it unfolds. No doubt. I mean, there's, well, there's the choice to do drugs, right? you know, and um, whether he lacked a dad to tell him not to do that, whether he was covering up his in own insecurities of being in this world that he felt, you know, in, um, inadequate in, mm -hmm. he chose to do drugs. He also had a, a Jess, you know, yeah. the, um, who, by the way, is like, oh, you could never get Marissa and like totally instigating and, you know, egging you on. and stuff. Yeah. But the things that human beings create in our minds are our reality, even mm -hmm. though it may not be the actual reality. Mm -hmm. So it okay. could, you know, there's there's things if you and none, none of us will ever, ever know what goes on inside the mind of somebody who who acts the way Trey did. Right. Or like you and, said, or like and like, once again, this isn't justification. These uh -huh. are things that that 
millions of people do on a daily basis and it's interesting or it's yeah. important for us to to discuss those things well, but yeah. in yeah we don't get to see the means we we you know especially in a court of public opinion we get to see the ends right, um, right. that's really what we care about um, mm -hmm. and and for good reason you know what i mean the choice is a choice we're all trying to eat better but a healthy breakfast doesn't have to be boring magic spoon has the amazing flavors you love but without all the bad stuff and it's amazing as a midnight snack right before bed. My favorite flavor, actually, my husband and I, is the cinnamon. And then I add some toasted pecans and um, some almond milk. And I did that this morning. I usually do it on podcast days. I don't know. It's kind of a ritual, but I love it. <laughs> Magic Spoon has zero, zero grams of sugar, and unless you go with the honey nut, and that has one woo, gram of sugar, <laughs> 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and it's only 140 calories a serving. Magic Spoon also gives you the option to build your own box. The nine available flavors to build your very own custom bundle are cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, cookies and cream, maple waffle, blueberry muffin, cinnamon roll, and honey nut. And even more exciting, Magic Spoon just brought back their cereal bars. They were so popular that they brought them back permanently. It's the perfectly convenient on-the-go companion for your cereal. I love that. There's no sugar in this stuff, okay? My daughter always wants a treat cereal, but now I give her Magic Spoon. She gets so excited by the flavors. She loves it. She thinks she's eating one of the, you know, more treat cereals on the market. Well, she is, but it's just the right kind of treat. <laughs> Go to magicspoon.com slash the OC to grab a custom bundle of cereal. And be sure to use our promo code, the OC, at checkout to save $5 off your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash the OC. And use the code, the OC, to save $5 off. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode. A change of season means longer days, better outdoor activities, and more ways to get healthier, including checking in on your health and wellness. With Everly Well, you can take action today by taking one of their at-home lab tests or by adding their vitamins and supplements into your daily routine. With over 30 at-home lab tests, you'll be able to choose the test that makes the most sense for you to get the answers you need. Like the women's health test or food sensitivity test, here's how it works. Everly Well ships products straight to you with everything needed in one package. Take your at-home lab test. Simply collect your sample and use the included prepaid shipping label to mail your test back to a certified lab and you will receive your results back in days. Listen, hormones can be <laughs> out of balance at any age mm. and especially at my age. So I took the women's health test and it helped me understand some thyroid health. I shared this info with my doctor and Rachel, I'm balanced now. I'm so happy to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> it's important to be balanced in life. And you know what? Everly well, it just make it so easy. Make it. It made it so easy for me to actually test my food sensitivities because I want to see what I'm reacting to because sometimes I do not feel good. And it was so easy to send in and get the results. And now I'm eating a much healthier for my body life. Good. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Sure. I get it. And for listeners of the show, Everly Well is offering a special discount of 20% off an at-home lab test at everlywell.com slash OC. That's everlywell.com slash OC for 20% off your next at-home lab test. everlywell.com slash OC. Hi, ladies. My name is Caitlin. I live in Boston. Um, I love the podcast. I listen to it every Tuesday on the way to work. Um, and I'm a huge fan of the OC. I started watching the show when it came out, and I still watch the reruns. And Logan, I just want to say that Trey was probably one of my favorite TV characters of all time. I think you just brought so many layers to him, and he felt such empathy for the poor guy. He had such a tough life, and he, he just couldn't help himself in so many ways. Um, and my question for you is, do you feel that what happened with um, Marissa on the beach was a little bit over the top, even for the OC? I just felt like Trey was a lot of things, but he never would have hurt Marissa to that extent. And it would have been great if that hadn't happened, because maybe you would have been on the show longer <laughs> and you were such an amazing character. Um, take care. Bye. 
Yeah, I think that's a, a, it ties right into what we're saying. I think a lot leads, you know, we don't just make, I mean, I don't know if you're a soft determinist, hard determinist, or believe in free will, but for me, I'm a little bit of a soft determinist. I think that a lot of environmental hereditary and just simply the accumulation of choices leads us to the mac the macro choice in the moment. And um, like we're saying, uh, he had uh, his girlfriend egging him on, uh, he had drugs, he had a lack of a dad. Um, and then he had Marissa, who he was mistakenly or not um, uh, uh, taking signals as uh, a green light for him. But, you know, having, if I'm going to be really frank, um, I, I'm I'm sober now, but I used to drink and I used to have a drinking problem probably as a, as a 20 year old, as I hope a lot of <laughs> 20 year olds do in many ways, because mm -hmm. I, I don't, I had a lot of fun in my 20s, but um, I can definitely tell you that you make choices that you would normally not make if you were sober. Mm -hmm. um, and I can, I think it's safe to say that Trey, through a lot of these episodes, was not sober. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so let's just talk about that. And, you know, do I condone that choice in the end? No. Um, but, you know, there are certainly um, bricks in the foundation uh, that have to be looked at. And I, I think that the OC and Josh and, and the writers did a great job of showing those, ch the, those choices that led up to that horrible night on the beach where he... Um, he uh, wore out his welcome. Right. It's a cautionary tale. And I think that's what this, these shows can, can certainly portray the, the, the devastation and the trauma and the pain of all of these characters and the aftermath. I mean, it can be educational, but it's also not pretty, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's not necessarily to, you know, and, and, you know, it, and the responsibility of creators who are trying to portray things, something that's very prevalent in our society. And uh, unfortunately, you're exactly right that, you know, I have a daughter in college and I'm constantly, you know, hearing these stories about, you know, their kids are doing things that they're supposed to. And instead of me wagging my finger at her, I say, take notes. Sure. Take yeah. notes. Absolutely. I mean, you feel like shit today. You don't want to go to work. Take notes. That's right. Mm -hmm. What, I mean, what am I going to do? Say, you know, you have to be on your journey and you have to figure these things out. Yeah, I, I was raised by kind of 20th century, great uh, generation parents. My dad flew in the world to my mom. You know? oh, wow. and, and so it was absolutely not. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, you will, you, I will eliminate this reality mm -hmm. from in front of you. And I think that's all the more reason why I chose to drive you towards it. Yeah, you know? for sure. Um, but that's not a mistake on my mom's part. That's how she was raised, too. Right. It's all yeah. cumulative. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I had the opposite experience. But, <laughs> and, and, but <laughs> my mom Go was out. like, yeah. Oh, you, oh, you smoking pot? Oh, you lost your virginity? Oh, cool. Let's talk about it. <laughs> mom, I don't talk about my vagina with you. <laughs> so that was my experience. Um, oh, no, no, no. Let's talk. <laughs> What's your name? <laughs> Listen, anyone who Her mom's a sex me, therapist. She's not like officially a sex therapist. Oh, she's but not. she counsels, and let me tell you. Well, you okay. seem to be doing okay, right? That's what you ask. But you know. <laughs> Watching that scene is hard, though. Like you guys did such a great you job. You did such a good job. Nice. Like asking her to howl with you, I'm like that might be the hardest thing as an actor to do convincingly. <laughs> like for me, just like those moments that are so. No. Well, they're also at, you know, four in the morning. Right, right. <laughs> you know, yeah, and you're not, feeling it's, it. It's they're never romantic at night. It's um, <laughs> you know, you're on you're on the beach. Yeah, um, and it's cold. And you know, if I remember that scene and that was ex one of those moments where I knew I had to be in DeSoto uh shooting oh, twenty-four no. at eight. You know, I had a call time at like eight AM. Oh no. Ah. So that I remember that scene. I was kind of working the other scene in twenty four in my mind too. Um and I was not equipped to handle, to juggle. <laughs> um, so you, you, but you know, luckily there, you know, when you're shooting a night shoot, there's a lot of uh, deliriousness. I found that people always ask if you prepare, but it's like, if the writing's good, that's all the work I have to do in that, in that character. And especially if you have the opportunity to do multiple episodes over multiple months, you know, the character and then that, that, um, you become very proficient in the character itself and then trying to find new things and developing that character. But, but using outside exhaustion mm -hmm. and, as is a very good tool. <laughs> no doubt. And, you know, it was a, it's an awkward, you know, look, any intimate scene is, is awkward. Um, yeah. I, don't, I don't think there's an yeah. actor here who, if, if they take their job seriously, would say that it 
feels romantic. It never feels oh. romantic. It's a grip eating lunch next to you. <laughs> you know, it's cameramen right here. You're, you know, the, you have to fight through so much to find that ounce of intimacy. And, um, and especially if it's an intimate scene where one, you know, one character is taking advantage of the other. Um, do you remember working with Misha on that? And because you both were so brave in the, I do. I remember we were both exhausted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I remember it was loud, and I remember we had to. We knew we were going to have to ADR the whole thing because oh. the waves, and uh, you know, especially a scene like that, you're just like, no. Yeah. That's because hard. a scene like that, the performance is so in the moment, yeah. and and how frustrating it is to ADR. So ADR is when you have to re-record it in a studio or whatever, so it's not an actual scene. I mean, mm. I'm sure a lot of people know that, but yeah, just in case. Yeah, there's a lot of elements you know, you're fighting against, yeah. you know, yeah. um, and, you know, especially when it comes to TV, they're finding, they're honing that 42 minutes. And so there's only so much you can do. There's so much left on the floor in the sand, so to speak. But, mm -hmm. you know, I certainly remember running up and down the beach because I had to be out of breath at one point, um, <laughs> you know, to make up, uh, you know, I think the post when she runs off and, mm -hmm. you know, you're sitting there just cold and it's not going to work. So I had to run up and down and just try to stay in it. Cause I also know I wasn't going to bet. I was going to be tortured by Jack Bauer oh. Oh <laughs> you know, in a few hours, few That's hours. So That's amazing. amazing. <laughs> so there's no such thing as 12 hour turnarounds when you're doing that. Well, no, when you work in two projects, they get their, you know, yeah, they get their I, option I, on you and That's they take claim, but it was both Fox shows. So they just took full advantage of this oh little actor. Do you find yourself being a method actor? so to speak? No, absolutely not. I, I, I recall like method actors, mm -hmm. certainly. Um, I use recall for emotion, mm -hmm. um, but I just act. Um, that's how I was trained. Um, I don't, I don't, I've never really understood the method actor, if I'm being mm -hmm. honest. Yeah. And obviously, proof is in the pudding. There's lots of great method actors out there. Um, but I'm much more of a Lawrence Olivier than I'm a Dustin Hoffman. Mm -hmm. mm. I found that, yeah, that can be sometimes similar. I mean, I can't. Yeah. Method to me, I'm just like, I can't not. Sorry, mm. I'm being, I don't want to be, too, no, I mean, it works for people, but it's not something I can, in my brain. Well, it abandons you eventually at certain roles. I just don't know how you would maintain it. But again, I'm, I guess I'm a lesser actor. I just, there are certain, uh, <laughs> you know, roles. How do you, how do you method, how do you recall um, a serial killer or? <laughs> yeah, um, that's a little like, well, how uh, can you tap into this? Kidnap, you know, kidnap, how do you, where do you go? Right. For your process at that point, I just feel like at some point it, it would abandon me. Yeah, being a lesser. Well, that, make, that makes sense. But, <laughs> no, <laughs> but yeah. it makes sense to like have to go there. Do you still get recognized for Trey? Or do or people? I mean, did because for you know for like Ben and Misha and Rachel, they get you know and Adam, they for, <laughs> <Not> forever, <laughs> forever are are referenced in every interview. It comes up. Does it? Did that happen to you for a while, or has that left? I mean, I think it's still there. I think there's always going to be, you know, there's always the, you'll always be trade to me. <laughs> you know, line. Um, okay. it, but, you know, more and more, I think I've moved away. Just, it's been almost 20 years. Right. So I don't, I think it's just out of just time, anything else. But certainly, I think in many of my fans' eyes, they, they came into my career uh, when they saw me as Trey. So yeah. and I love that entrance because um, I really love that character. Um, I, I really have a lot of like empathy for Trey. Mm -hmm. so. Were there any scenes that you, well, you said you don't remember, like shooting them and whatnot, but any that stand out to you as either like the most fun or the most challenging or, you know, well, I guess what we just talked about sounded pretty challenging. Um, mm. But like a funny one where you broke or do you break? <laughs> you seem I, like you don't break too much. I mean, I'm not a, a yeah, I'm, I, I'm I'm You're pretty like, I'm not focused and in, intense guy. Um, when I, I mean, I take my work a little too, I probably took it way too seriously back then. Um, I've learned to kind of let go a little bit more. Um, I, I remember, um, I do remember the, the, the rager. Mm -hmm. I think oh. it, was the, the, it was for your birthday. It was my birthday. Oh, yeah. Was it my birthday? It was your birthday. Yeah. And, and, that's right. Yes. Yeah. And I it turns you. into this big rager. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and floater, girl. floater girl. And it was your house, right? Yeah. Yes. I mean, look, I'm going to, this is a, a bit of a non sequitur now and digression, but I do remember that being 
Bosworth's house. Yes, Brian yeah, Bosworth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. No, yeah. Absolutely. And I, I mean, a huge college football guy, <laughs> and, um, and and I just I remember being completely starstruck by the location. <laughs> and the house is <laughs> you know, massive up on that hill. Gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah, massive house. Yeah. And yeah. I think they even had us, you know, kind of our holding areas in certain rooms, and mm-hmm. you could see his. I mean, I just was so, <laughs> so starstruck by the location. Stuff. <laughs> You know, and I had been to many locations at that yeah, point. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I really don't remember a shooting, which I should absolutely remember. Like when I was watching this last episode, there's this huge shootout and debate shot. Oh, yeah. 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 I, I, could, I, could, I can't yeah, yeah. rack my head around you know, how we shot that, when we shot that. It's wild. We, I mean, we, I don't remember. We have that. the same, but I guess one of the things is that I actually watched the show and then I would make people watch it. <laughs> after drinking wine and i was like hey let's throw it in you know <laughs> and then but i think sometimes my memory is that i actually watch the show not necessarily that i remember so it's it's should we say the synopsis really quick of the show of yeah. the episode i mean of the episode sure go for it kirsten hits rock bottom after caleb's funeral prompting sandy to stage an intervention jimmy cooper tate returns to newport <laughs> to renew ties with a mourning julie Jess convinces Trey into participating in a dual drug deal. <laughs> in a dual. <laughs> a dual. <laughs> a dual at the bait shop. <laughs> Same thing. That turns into a shootout at the bait shop nightclub. And Ryan learns the truth about what happened between Trey and Marissa, leading to an epic confrontation <sighs> directed by our lovely Ian Toynton, written by the Josh Schwartz. The Josh. Josh Schwartz. <laughs> Josh. And that original air date is May 19, 2005. Oh, Lord. Is he here? Yes. <laughs> uh, we have a special guest. Some of you may have heard of. What's up, Josh? How are you, man? I'm doing Thanks great. You. It's great to see your face, hear your voice. Excellent. How are you? How is they? How are they treating you in the podcast? <laughs> in the pool house. So far, that the seat is not too hot yet. <laughs> All right, so. good. Did Rachel remember that you had been on the show? <laughs> she she looked at me like I think I remember. No, she did. She, she's recalled everything beautifully. That- she remembered that she was on the show, so that's good. <laughs> Barely. <laughs> well, I'm like Rachel. I've yeah. I when I watched that episode, this this episode we're going to talk about is the first time I'd seen any of the episodes. So I'm on, I'm on at least on an even playing field with her. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. One of my kind. <laughs> yeah. So we haven't even talked about this this um, epic episode, and I, honestly, I think it's one of one of my favorite of the entire series. Actually, this whole second season, I think, has been my favorite as a viewer so far. The fourth one was fun to do, but the second right. season really Notice was... Notice how she just skipped right over three. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, we haven't gotten there yet, but... <laughs> but um, we only have you for a little bit of time, right? Yeah, I thought I was coming on to talk a little image and heat, but I'm here for yep. whatever whatever you uh, would like to... Uh, to yeah, do no, we, you know, we didn't... We've been talking about the episode and we have gently brought up that scene well we've talked about it a bit so we would love to hear anything you'd like to share with everybody about it well um i feel like that was like the last scene we shot of the season but if my memory is correct i could be wrong but i feel like we ended there um it was we've been building to that finale all you know all season long obviously and um I feel like the original pitch may have come from Bob D, if I'm correct. It was this, you know, the, the shooting. Um, and we staged, you know, a pretty dramatic fight scene. You guys got really into it. If memory serves, there's a glass table mm-hmm. that gets shattered. I mean, it's kind of like the, we, we felt like we had to go for it in a way that we hadn't in any of other, the other prior kind of physical encounters that, that Ryan had gotten into. Obviously, this was something extremely primal between two brothers. And then... Um, Marissa having no choice but to intervene and, and pull the trigger and what that meant. And, you know, Alex Pitsavis had, um, as we've talked about, would send music every week, you know, to, to listen to and just kind of that could be right for the show. And um, I remember her sending the, the, the CD, because that's the era it was in, um, with that Image and Heat song on it. And uh, it was around the time I believe we were heading to Miami. Or maybe it was earlier in the season. But anyway... I heard that song. It was immediately like, don't know where that song is going, but it's going on the show. Like, it's just too haunting. It's too, I never heard anything like it. It was it just like it had to go on the show. Rachel, you look so bored right now. I'm not. I have, some, I have a hair in my eye. <laughs> Why are you doing 
just like, you keep talking. Don't mind me. I literally have a hair in my eye. I can't you're see. literally like removing a big <laughs> eyelashes while I'm trying to. Uh, <laughs> Hold on, let me just take my extensions out. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I'm so, listening. We, so new, 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 new song was going in the show somewhere, and it felt perfect for the funeral um, and for Caleb's funeral. And then Norman Buckley, our editor, was the one who was like, check this out, and had brought the song back to reprise over the shooting. And it was just this moment where we were like, yeah, this is really going to work. This feels like super dramatic. It ties the whole episode together. It coming in on the middle of the song like that just felt really unique and powerful. And, you know, eight years later, it was still being parodied on Saturday Night Live. So, <laughs> Oh, was it eight like, years later like, they did that skit? It was. It wasn't at the time. Rule, it was no, no. It was much. It was randomly, like eight years later or something, <laughs> much later in the front of. And uh, to me, that shows that we we did our job. If eight years later they could do an SNL parody and everybody knows what you're talking about, then the scene the scene was memorable. I found um, a um, quote from Imogen, and she mm -hmm. said that it was really important. She said that she, um, before you guys had used it that a DJ had told her, this will never play on the radio. Nobody will ever like it. And because of the OC, it, it, it connected. And she was so grateful for that. That's awesome. We had requested that she not license it to anyone else. We like, you know, asked for that exclusively. Um, and, you know, because you didn't want to like have it have been on some other show the week before. Uh, so she did. She waited it out. And, you know, it's definitely not a song at that time that would have been an obvious radio song. Mm -hmm. um, and then it got worked into a remix. You know, there was some big song um, several years later, a couple of years, you know, we ended up using on Gossip Girl, actually, where the, the chorus was part of the song. So the song has right. kind of lived on in, in multiple versions. She also said that um, the Dear Sister, they did not ask permission and they she got nothing from it. They just did it. It has like 37 oh. million views on yeah. YouTube, we heard. The SNL skit? Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll take that up with those guys. <laughs> 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 he paid handsomely. <laughs> I have a couple questions for you real quick, though. There was, yeah. um, you know, when in, when this episode came out, there was a lot of speculation about, like, what was going to happen. And there's a line where Seth says, there's a, there's a, the doorbell rings, and he says, the way things are going, I bet that's Oliver. There was a <laughs> huge speculation from the fans that you were going to bring back Oliver. Did you put that line in there because of that? Or was it that oh, just yeah, coincidence? Yeah, that's, yeah, we were just too online at that moment. So we were definitely responding to, okay. to you know, what was out there. <laughs> I also want to say, by the way, that, Logan, you crushed this whole thing. It was so good. Yeah. It was bringing a whole other level of intensity to the, to the part. And um, it just, that's what really elevated it. And I feel like you, you and Ben had this great, dynamic and you kind of brought out the best in each other and that reaction that you have when she first shoots you that look back to her is just so good it's so that's good right. you can't script that and i feel like that's a huge part of why people still remember that scene well we were just saying um that when you have good writing and a good director in like ian it, it yeah. you really just follow the pillars of the verse as it is you know and let it kind of guide you and i, I remember it being a very we knew exactly what the the gesture you know the cinema was going to be in a way and ben of course mm -hmm. and i i think felt really safe to be unsafe with each other you know so we went for it well it looked like you guys did a lot of the stunt fighting yourselves pretty sure we did almost all of it except i don't think they the allowed crash. the crash you know ben's a little too important to <laughs> the class table but you know yes there was something in the choreography that was so real so dangerous and scary and there was something also that came out in that scene that was so important because now it's not just about Marissa. He goes back to you. You, I didn't want to steal that car. It goes back to so much. And then something in Trey comes out that he actually is going to fucking kill his, his brother. There's this anger and it's almost that he knows that he's, he's surviving. Is he defending because he knows that his brother will kill him? Mm. Is there, do you remember or thinking about that at all or? I, I do remember, you know, talking about, you know, what it's like to fight with your family versus like a friend. And I think, uh, you know, switches get pull, uh, flicked a lot easier when you're with blood, you know, and um, and and blood is thicker than water, of course. And I think that's why we I don't know. I actually have the same dynamic with my brother, 
I, you know, Josh, I'm just letting them know I have a twin. I don't know if you know this or not. Um, oh, no, I didn't know that. Yeah. And, and you know, um, and my brother and I were Cain and Abel growing up. We did not get along. And, but, and when we fought, you know, one of us fought to the death and the other one had to understand that dynamic and kind of pull away. And, and that's just what it was. Um, and, and I'm sure it is in many other sibling rivalries. Or mm -hmm. um, My brother and I get along great now, but you know, we, we definitely had our, our fist fights and, and stuff through, through the years. And, you know, um, one is willing to go a little further than the other always. How far is, I think it's different. Like when you person. reach for like the phone, <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> not with my shit. actual brother, but with, yeah. Right. right. Oh, sorry. Yes. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you just can't, you're like, oh, he's about to smash his head in. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs> but it was so, it was so, so primal. It was, yeah, and it was, and it was, yeah. and it was so shocking and i think there's something about watching it now that i don't remember it having as much it was just so impactful mm -hmm. and it was sad and tragic and this like you said the look on on and like yeah. like you said it was closure for marissa and trey because because of this you know terrible thing that he had happened between them good first shot by marissa by the way first time pulling the trigger right <laughs> I, w I thought the Center same mass. thing i was like how did she know how to like she was just like well it feels a little lucky it. she's kind of shaky if i'm watching right it, yeah. but i can see it absolutely hitting its mark so. but do you feel like a whole generation of kids are gonna not know that it came that, that song came from this snl skit or all these other memes like game of thrones we just watched one on game of thrones yeah it's uh yeah, I don't know. I mean, I certainly didn't know what the song was. I still, sometimes the song will come on. It's so, inter you know, it's so interesting, the beginning of it. And it's it's only until I it get, gets into it, I realize like somebody's played it because I'm in a bar or something like that. Uh. And I'm like, oh, I'm stuck in the Image and Heap song now. And uh, I've had somebody actually karaoke it uh, because no. I was- Oh, really? Yes, That's a really I'm, hard karaoke. I was just gonna yeah, say. Absolutely it is. Hearing yeah. that would be it's like- a very, <laughs> avant-garde and and progressive song it's i when i saw like saw the skit and understood the scene i was like wow i mean then I mean, you guys are already known for the music but this was i thought a great uh, strong choice um, i definitely think it was our most the, the most uh impactful musical choice we made on the show for sure hmm. i think uh, when yeah. people think I of the oc they the think of this famous song from yeah. the OC. I that in say. california for sure Oh, um, right, that, <laughs> the theme song. That's what we played it 92 times for people or whatever it was. But um, I do remember also after the episode aired, getting calls from like executives and what have you, whose daughters were screaming and, and called them like hysterical crying. And they thought something terrible had happened to like one of them or their loved ones. And they're just like, this is Chatre. Like it was just like really, really had uh it worked that's all i could say it worked it was a good kind of cliffhanger you uh you aim for yeah well i watched him like like marissa we hit our target right <laughs> <laughs> but i was just surprised i'm like trey dies i'm not allowed yeah. to say oh do you not um, know i don't uh <laughs> you don't know <laughs> no i only know because i said this before and mindy told me what happened but i didn't know uh, i didn't even know caleb died by the way when we were first started this I'm there like, you were at the funeral well you know i I can't, I don't know. So what, but speaking of the Mine funeral. Is a terrible thing to waste, yes. I love that Sandy uses the eulogy to roast Caleb, <laughs> which was, you know, being. You know. Yeah, what else are you gonna say? Yeah. yeah terrible. Was, this guy sucked, good riddance. <laughs> yeah. That was humor. But since I have you here, or we have you here, yeah. that the, the, the intervention scene was just incredible. And I'll, you know, Kelly Rowan did an incredible job and she it said so much, but I thought about the, the season finale of the first season where she was so dramatic when Ryan leaves. Was it a coincidence that you gave her as powerful of a scene um, in her emotion for the second season? Or did you uh, have that in mind that you wanted to give her that? I mean, we certainly knew that uh, she was capable of it, you know. So uh, we knew, given the performance at the end of season one, that whatever we wrote for her, she'd be she'd be able to deliver. And she did. Yeah. 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 Yes. And Logan, forgive me, I'm from fuzzy on the details here, but you would come out of you're doing theater, right? In Will at um, in Massachusetts. That's right. At uh, Williamstown. Williamstown Theater Festival. Right. And Ben had worked at Williamstown. You guys had crossed paths at Williamstown a little bit mm -hmm. peripherally. 
Yeah, Ben, I was, it was, I believe my second or third summer that I did about five, but Ben was, it was his first summer. He was, a uh, he was, you know, one of the apprentices, but he was the hot, you're definitely one of the hot shot uh, actors there. And he and I did a, a play together, this fantastical play. I was telling the, the <laughs> ladies um, uh, called Blue Bluebird. And he had, uh, all I remember is, and I've still kind of always called him out on it to this day, is he played one of the trees that he has to come out on stilts. <laughs> And I mean, if you could find the photos, he would be, I'm sure, happy about it. Um, he already but, won't come on the podcast, so I can only yeah, imagine no, what photo well, would do for him. Well, you know, you never know. Have Vince, you talked Vince, to him about coming on our podcast? Oh, I have. <laughs> yeah, hey, Logan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'm your messenger, but um, I know, Ben. He, 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 he's, uh, he's somebody who will surprise. You never know. You guys already kind of had a big brother, little brother dynamic in a way, I guess, going into it. Yeah. I remember that we kind of leaned into no doubt. I, I thought it was, it's a great dynamic considering because we, we, we didn't have so much um, familiarity, you know, where we were like besties, but there was definitely a, um, you know, an older brother, younger brother. Um, but yet he was kind of king of the castle when I walked in and, um, mm -hmm. and I loved that. I think we used that. And, and I, that if to answer your question, Rachel, if, if I remember, and I don't remember a lot of the scenes we shot, but working with Ben was always a highlight there because it was just a familiarity and we worked really well together. We kind of came from the same school in many ways at Williamstown and, mm -hmm. um, and, and, um, and really, um, really valued, um, process, you know, on stage and, in, in, and respect, uh, respect each other's process. So mm -hmm. it's yeah. always I, know, a, I remember a he felt the same way about you and definitely brought his A game. Yeah. Do you think there's this um, idea that when Trey shows up in the beginning of the season that, you know, Ryan's like, yeah, let's he's very cautious about letting Trey in. But he, everyone around him is like, give your brother a chance. And his spidey sense, his intuition is, is I don't there's it's never gone well. And by the end here, it's he just is resolved to say, see, I told you. And this has to end that he spent all all season trying. And and it just didn't work the way it worked for him, right? Because he was never as he was never following the path that Trey was following. He was following, trying to do his best, right? And he came and and they just have two different journeys, and it didn't work. Yeah, and I think sometimes if you come from a you know your broken family or you have you know there's abuse in the family and one sibling is older than the other, it impacts the siblings differently, you know. And I think definitely Trey got more you know it landed on him in a way that kind of shaped him and sometimes you're like i got treated this way therefore i'm going to treat other people this way and mm -hmm. and just the difference of being born a couple of years later you decide i'm going to make a different choice and i'm not going to repeat that you know so the way that abuse trickles down can, can kind of manifest in different ways and different personalities i think there's also a, a little bit of an element of luck you know that comes with or mm -hmm. at least in this in our cinema you know that you know, mm -hmm. these two boys, one just had maybe a little bit more luck, you know, than the other. And one might make it to the gas station on empty, whereas the other guy, you know, he, he runs down and, and doesn't make car. it. To, or is, and has to steal a <laughs> car. Ryan had Sandy as his lawyer and Trey did not. You know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, again, advocates, you know, right. who, who's advocating for you? Um, well, and that's what Marissa is the first one who somewhat advocates for her, for him. And, yeah. and he responds to that in a big way. And mistakes probably that advocacy as, you know, yep. uh, coming on to him or um, flirting with him. And yet all she really, I think, wanted was what, you know, Ben maybe couldn't figure out how to want, which is like, I want the same for you as I wanted for, you know, uh, Ryan. Right. Um, and then you create, but you created this, um, this character of Jess, which we called very arch and like the classic villain, this yeah, yeah. person that was almost worse than Trey, just to somehow pull him away from the good and, uh -huh. into the dark. Is that that was that was very? I mean, yeah, she's she's wild. Re reframe him. Yeah. 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 Now she works in casting. Yeah. Right. I know you have to go, yeah. but did you always know that Marissa was going to shoot Trey? Do we always know? Yeah. From the day I was born. No, I yes. mean I think we figured it out. It was part of the conversations of bringing Trey back on, and you know it's similar in the same. The end of season one was about Ryan's past coming and that undertow pulling him back out, and. That was the shape of the end of season two as well. So it felt like once Trey came back and it was going to go bad, it was only going to go one way. And there was a lot of conversations I remember with Bob and, and Stephanie about how the season was going to end. And it just, you said Cain and Abel, and it did have that kind of mm. biblical kind of archetype. Romulus and Remus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Marissa definitely gets the intense storylines. <laughs> no doubt. What if Summer just well, ran don't in? Tell Rachel, like, don't tell Rachel uh-huh. what happens at the end of season three. Because, uh, uh- <laughs> You know, oh, I want to know, you should have put the Imogen Heap song there, too. Just like every time well, there's a death. You don't remember, you don't remember, but she actually does perform Hallelujah over the closing scene of season three. But um, so we oh. brought her back to, to infuse the end of season okay. one and the end of season two musically. I remember, mm. but he carries her and she's, yeah. Do you remember the she end does. of um, the, the oh, I shouldn't say that. in season four? No. Do you remember what Definitely happened? Definitely not. Okay. <laughs> I don't, I, but I will say, I remember when we, when Seth and Summer run into the scene at the yeah. end and we debated that because you guys always kind of lived in your, in a, in a slightly different version of the show, uh-huh. you know, where, and so having you guys enter into that storyline was always a bit jarring because it was just, you guys were sort of the, you know, the Beatrice and Benedict kind of like comedic element. Mm-hmm. It was always a dramatic piece to it, but it never fully crossed into the kind of the Ryan stuff. And so having you guys land in that was literally into the crossfires. Just yeah. sent us on in. Well mm. done, Rachel. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> on that note, you're welcome. You we may leave. <laughs> Logan, it was so good to see you. It's great to see you too, Josh. Congrats on everything, man. Take care. Likewise. Thanks Bye-bye. so much Bye, for girl. stopping Bye. by. Bye. Bye, bitches. Bye, Bye bitches. <laughs> you know, we've touched on the intervention and, and Kirsten's need for sobriety. Um, you're looking at me like, I know you have like a lot you want to say. <laughs> yeah, M- Mindy mouth here. <laughs> yeah. The things that were very impactful for me were obviously, um, you know, the first thing that's going on is that Seth notice finds this rehab document or, you know, this pamphlet and he brings it to Ryan. And <laughs> does he think for a second it has to be, it's for Sandy. But I think one of the story, one of the things that I would like to discuss was just how interesting the journey was for Seth when he realizes that this is what's going on with his mom and this and the scene with Sandy and Sandy and Seth that was probably one of my favorite scenes in the entire series which scene when he's saying hey just so you know um you know this is what's going on and because Seth says mom hasn't been very mom-esque and this dynamic between between father and son you know and Peter and and Adam just doing so well and his realization that well come on her dad just died she's having a few drinks what do you mean you want to shove her to send her away what maybe maybe you're the one that caused this and that this kind of classic thing of he's number one in denial number one you haven't there's number two you haven't told me and this realization when he talks to summer about the fact that you know i maybe i'm partly to blame i left last summer and summer says I think it's bigger than you. You are being self-involved. And when he's just, those scenes were just so well done with that. He's in complete denial. Can I, can I just, I just want to say one thing I loved about that scene in the kitchen, you know, where uh, Seth and Sandy are fighting about it um, was the end of the scene that they didn't go to coverage on uh, Seth. It was just him throwing that final zinger of a line over his shoulder. It was so like it just felt so that that is the dynamic the teenager just leaving the room with one you know it just there's something about um that we didn't get to even see him say that line he just throws it over his shoulder and it landed even i just felt it landed even better mom's a drunk she's going to rehab plan your afternoon accordingly and that's norman buckley editing that it's Mm -hmm. just this well, I'm, yep. I'm angry and he doesn't know how to process. And then when Sandy comes back upstairs and discusses it more and he's calmed down a little bit and he's like, this isn't us. This isn't supposed to be us. His only reference to this kind of thing is that it's Ryan's life. But mm-hmm. somehow this idyllic world has just been shattered mm-hmm. and you can't help but think like, yeah, what's this all about? And I can't send my mom away. And, and I mean, I, I don't even obviously as adults we could say oh you're being selfish seth this is what she needs nobody knows what anybody needs in these situations it's just like you know right yeah i agree what was it in that scene in the was it the master that they played it yeah it was the master and you don't see um uh you don't see his face he just it very kind of petulantly it's a, a very petulant just you know can i swear on this yes. yeah, yeah. yeah just All it's a fuck time. you you know um and and it's to you know ryan who walks in and they're 
but there was just like a, a handoff of the scene but normally you would think especially on the like network you would go to that coverage of that line mm -hmm. so it lands but i actually think it landed even better on uh, ian or the editor whoever uh, decided right yeah and then when she actually does you know Haley shows up and she sh and, and she takes her out for a spa day and the actual intervention i was curious i mean we didn't have a chance to ask josh the show intervention it, it debuted in on march 6th of that year and this was this came out a few months later. Was that like a reality show? Yeah, it was like a sh yeah where they actually did it interventions mm -hmm. because okay. I don't and I was like okay so even though it was kind of a short condensed thing, mm -hmm. it's very reminiscent of that. And it's a like, Kirsten comes in, and she's like hello, she's all sweet, nice to meet you. Okay, what's this all about? And they instantly start uh, declaring you know that they're they're scared for her and what they feel, and she's like everyone's overreacting. And Haley, you're the one that was doing tricks. She instantly just throws it back and she's defensive. And when she's and when Ryan goes to speak and she goes, don't say a word. I brought mm -hmm. you into this house. But what he says is, yeah, because but I like how he, he doesn't look at her at first. Like Ben's eyes are just like inverted, like down. And then once he finally addresses her, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he's like, because my mom couldn't take care of me and I don't want that. And, and you would think that is such a great argument. And Kirsten looks and she goes, and I am not going but she turns and sees seth and i wonder what it is that she just melts and everything she you see all it's her kid i mean as we know like your kid is like your achilles heel right like anything i mean you gotta go are, yeah like oh. but you see the pain the shame the embarrassment this like this yeah. letting go and because she has been trying to to handle all of this and it's, she's it's a very human moment i mean that's those are the most human moments when you realize your kids are just as much a human as you are and oh, you're just yeah. as flawed as them and, and that they're going to raise you eventually right you know and i don't know exactly their history but certainly that's just got to be a pillar in their in the relationship between them and the show that he kind of was the parent in that moment. well i think it's actually really significant because we haven't seen kirsten and seth He's, he, you know, he's on his self, it's, I mean, so he's on a self-involved journey right now. He's been saying it he's quite a bit. Permanently on a self-involved <laughs> journey. <laughs> and, and he's navigating and this, his mom lets him be him. We have not seen a moment like that because she, she has done that the last season. She did that with Ryan. And, but now it's Seth that kind of melts her heart. This is uh, just one of the most heartbreaking because the show is known for comedy and we have a we don't really have that much of it thank goodness in this episode mm -hmm. but it was done so well Can you imagine with if, like, care. Seth runs in with a joke afterwards to shoot you <laughs> 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 oh, right God. no I, I just don't i don't remember the snl skit just starts playing <laughs> <laughs> i don't think there would have been one yeah. <laughs> <That's true fair. laughs> yeah i just don't remember it being as impactful but i know that it was impactful when it aired but now it's like I don't know what you felt watching it, but it was it was Wait. just heartbreaking. Which one now? Just the whole thing. Okay, just the in whole general. Episode. Just the whole thing. What are we talking about? I do remember thinking when I watched it the other night, like, wow, there we're 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 going there everywhere, every everywhere. scene. Like this is and this is a final this is number twenty four <laughs> um in the season. Yeah. So. It was very intense. Yeah. It was to intense. say the least. But then and the other thing I'll just touch on briefly. But I don't know what happens. Like Jimmy comes back, you guys are gonna be together. But I know Tate's not on the show, so I'm like, well, what happened? Okay. Right. Well, it was actually TBD. so when when the doorbell does ring, yeah. and um, after Julie asks for something to wear for Marissa, and Marissa's being kind of nice to her, but I could I recognize that silhouette anywhere of Tate at the door. Mm. You just know. I mean, Except he gets for... really like flustered when we talk about her yeah. and Tate, really? her and Jimmy, and their little like sex scene. <laughs> well, you know, Tate and I, oh. just as a quick side note, yeah. if there's anyone I've kept up with, uh, it's Tate. Because really? Tate and I have been in a volleyball game. What? That has been, what? I'm not kidding. Has been going on for over a decade now. Are you serious? It's a very loosely I gathered... I think I've heard about this. And yeah. Ben shows up too same, sometimes. Ben's been there too. Yeah. Same times. team or? It depends. We're on any team that just feels even. But volleyball? Like beach ball? beach volleyball there's a group of about i don't know 15 of us on a thread and every single one of <laughs> us is our you know I mean, one of us is the leader and begins the thread on thursday and starts to see who wants in and 
Like every weekend you go? I mean, I'd say we have taken certainly breaks, yeah. especially with pandemics. Yeah. Right, and, right. Um, but we we just had our 10 year anniversary. We all got together and went to. <laughs> was he in the here big, in L.A.? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's whenever he's here, he, we play. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. So I cute. think we're playing on uh, Sunday. Tater we Tater won't Tater. be there. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, I'm like, I'm bad. He didn't call me. <laughs> well, he, he is also like myself. A lot of people come and go. It's kind of a ragtag. Yeah, yeah he's but in always Texas about, now. Yeah. You know, eight of or at least four. All you need is four to play beach volleyball. Oh, so, right. Yeah, we've right. kept that ball in the air, pun intended. <laughs> That's awesome. That he, he cool. I've, I, yeah, Tate, Tate Kelly, and, and now this one. But I hadn't seen her for 10 years. Oh, me. But yeah, Tate, Kelly, and Peter, we stayed in contact. Mm. Tate, I'll just pick up the phone and call from time to time. Just because he's telling you when I say. Were you and Tate very close? What was your relationship like? I mean, you guys obviously had a you know an intimate relationship. We uh, he's my favorite person. He's literally my favorite. (laughs) One of mine too. It's just he's so awesome. Just so funny. I mean, even when we were on set, (laughs) he would tell stories and he would just do it with the just so much humor and joy like that dude practices joy no doubt. like you know at you know attitude of gratitude it's not just an attitude it's you got to practice that that joy and i just we have so much fun and that's what we would just giggle the whole time so i was so devastated when he was leaving so him coming back was just you know with powdered sugar donuts from 7-eleven no less i didn't know if they're are they good do you know? I remember. You, you, like you saw that I took one little bite. <laughs> You're like, I'm not eating this. Aren't they called donuts? Donuts? At 7 Eleven? Yeah, I think they're those little they pa- Are they the name? packages? Oh, the hostess yeah, one? The hostess. I think they're called donuts, <laughs> if I'm remembering correctly. But you know, it, it, it is kind of it's interesting. really gone off the rails here. <laughs> <laughs> that, they, that they instantly they would reconnect. Joey says, I'm, I feel guilty about this and let's try it again. But you, you know, is Jimmy a bad guy? I don't know, but he's uh, he definitely has questionable, I think, um, reasons for being there. And we'll find out. But but it is very sweet when Marissa says that we want to try and be a family again. And she actually hugs Julie, I think, for the first time in the entire series, mm. Mm. which was very, very sweet. I think this is the time when when Julie actually um, become stops being an antagonist and becomes a protagonist hmm. in, for the show. I look forward to seeing what happens. <laughs> <laughs> There's something really important that Summer does throughout this when she notices she re- she oh how Marissa's awkward around Trey. Yeah, she notices that, and then she, it's the scene. Do you was know so what? Ju- Sorry, that just reminded me. Who says the line like? To the the dudes that come for the drugs and they're like, oh, your rice rocket. I was like, she oh goes, my God. go get in your rice rocket and go. How but did I you get like, away with that? I couldn't believe it. I couldn't so, believe it. I yeah. was like, oh shit. We were the Wild West, I think back then. Yeah, back then for sure. There's been but, so many of those times where we're watching things and we're like, there's no way. But that is some, you know, that is a comment on maybe white Orange County, classic Newport biatch, as as he calls her, and mm-hmm. then she calls him a. a derogatory name no i felt it was coming on me too because i certainly it didn't register to me on the day and then i was like how was i in a scene allowing yeah. that line right, right. to exist right and you know and uh there's just different time and i was uh naive right you know huh. i think we all were naive at some point in our lives so. yeah for sure 100 percent. Mm. but yes yeah, summer does notice and then she confronts the beauty of that scene where she confronts Marissa and says, look, I'm your best friend. Let's go sunbathing and get some pancakes, but not until you tell me what's going mm-hmm. on. And we don't need to hear it. Yeah. But Marissa just cries. Mm. She just cries. She's still in, um, having a PTSD and now crying out of the pain, out of the trauma. But she's also crying that she gets to share it with somebody. And thank God somebody noticed because she's trying to cover and protect everyone, but and, and not let the secret out. But that's what I wondered because Summer like instantly tells Seth, who instantly tells Ryan. I was I, that there because like I don't know it was something that maybe Summer felt like she had to share because I'm sure Marissa wasn't like go you know I think the town crier you know what I mean yeah I my thought was why didn't they go to Sandy but Sandy's got a lot going on he's at rehab he's dropping mm-hmm. Kirsten off at rehab and and Seth doesn't learn that lesson until season four that he needs to go to Sandy for 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 these very, very big things. I was just thinking of the scene where you and Ben are switching with Marissa when she's having PTSD. Do you remember this scene? It it wasn't this episode, so Mm -hmm. it's... It was this episode before. The episode before, Mm -hmm. and Marissa 
is like trying to put it behind her and shows up to the pool house to to make out with Ben and and it's intercut between both of you. Oh wow! So it was then so then well done. Yeah, you. yeah, it's really well done. Oh wow! She's like picturing. You were just having you flashbacks. Were there. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm in her mind. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a lot of release in that that moment and i think like especially with teenagers mm -hmm. you know you you want you're trying to find those moments where you can adult put on the and i think sometimes we just you know there's always a gossip you know element to teenagers so yeah, yeah. oh yeah for sure i think that's enough about the episode hi rachel and melinda uh, my name is sophia i'm from denmark and I'm a huge fan of the OC and this podcast. Um, and how exciting that Logan Marshall Green is on. So I was watching Normal People, uh, the TV show, and suddenly the song Hide and Seek came on. And I got so emotional, both because the scene in Normal People was good, but also because I was immediately uh, brought back to the scene where Marissa, she shoots straight. Uh, but I was wondering, is there a song for you that yeah, instantly reminds you of the OC? It can both be from set or your personal life or just a song from the show. Thank you so much and uh, bye. Oh, so Do you have a song that reminds you of the OC besides <laughs> this one? <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I definitely can say the song reminds me now of the show, but not of the process of shooting that scene. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we mm -hmm. spoke about it a little bit before, but it, you know, when you're shooting the scene, you don't have, a, rarely do you have the music playing. Um, now, sometimes the director will show you what he or she intends uh, to put under it, but certainly on TV, you don't, you don't know. And we didn't in the moment. Um, but it, it just goes to show how important music is, I think. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I have directed something and, and you know, there's the, the saying, there's, these, there's the movie that you write, the movie that you shoot, and the movie that you cut. But now having directed, I, I do believe there's a fourth film, which is the, the final film, which is the, the movie that you score. It changes everything. It can, you know, and, and certainly with the movie I directed, uh, not to stay on that, but the composer is it was a great uh, singer songwriter who came on uh jason isbell and he really showed me the film in many ways how he scored it and and he had an original song there and i kind of understood it in a way it's just like i think with this song hide and seek i i i understood really what the intent was the the gestures were um and it really the scoring and the music always is the final piece um and and without it or with a different song it's just going to be a, a completely different i scene iconic i'm sure still but i don't know if it would ever be as iconic if josh had not known that he you know really as we just heard place he held a placeholder for it and it, it kind of like i think probably spoke to him this is it or to the editor whoever made that final decision um but i think it's so interesting how music guides us not just through our lives, but through our narratives that we watch. Because mm -hmm. take any movie, any TV show, or any play, and if you put different score to it, your emotional attachment to it is going to be different. Right. Um, and certainly it was a perfect song, I think, in the end. And it yeah. just goes to show that what we do as actors is just a very small part. We do what we do, mm -hmm. and then they put between editing and music and sound it it puts our performance together we can we only do what we do and then there's a whole team of people that that right. put it together into this into what the audience ends up seeing yeah you have to i, mean, I think you have to be an orphan you have to orphan your choices as an actor i think it's the best way because i agree you know we're you're on this you get to be on the center you get to be on the mark and everybody's focused on you get you know and there's becomes a lot of ego that gets thrown into that but you get humbled really quickly as an actor, I think, in realizing your place in the mm -hmm. final um, product, uh, because we are just a department and we're not, you know, the department. Mm -hmm. We are a department. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, really your job as an actor is to show up on time, yep. know your lines and hit your mark. Yep. Yep. Um, now, those who do it really well understand, I think, all of the other departments, mm -hmm. the elements, and so that they are acting for a, as a whole. Right. You know, not in a selfish way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I love that you're saying that. It's just, it's, yeah. <laughs> like, it's the difference between, like, being, like, good, hopefully, but also professional, you know? No doubt. Yeah. Yep. Being a technical actor is a very, very important attribute. I agree. Absolutely. Yeah. One of my favorite people in the world is Dylan McDermott. Mm. And, um, you know, one thing Dylan has always maintained is he is, if you look at Dylan, he's as sharp as anyone can be in focus because he knew standing <laughs> on that mark correctly, just the technical aspect of making the eyes as sharp as possible allows for so much more. Mm. You, know, you can do whatever you want, but if you're constantly in and out buzzing, you're not going to get that those choices on screen. Um, so whenever you look at Dylan, a lot of the times he's kind of coming up from just looking at his mark, yeah. <laughs> um, but nailing everything he does. It's important to know lenses as well and knowing where you are. I mean, and knowing what's required for different mediums, whether you're on stage or, or on film, it's, I always try to give that advice to young people, like know your light, know your lenses, know how far, <laughs> know what, what's going on and, and do, it, it can only make you better and also just more proficient. And I always like request the bright pink tape. <laughs> so like, I don't have it's to true. look and yeah. I like out of, so I can totally be in a scene, but like out of my peripheral, I can hit my mark. It's so smart. I never even <laughs> thought about that. Yeah. You know, those dark greens and blues, you just, can't, you, you actually can't have it. to kind of find. And that's, <laughs> that's, that's, you know, a cerebral that you don't need to be uh, super quality. You don't need in your right. process. So right. it's actually really, I, I think mean, I'm, I'm going to start. You're like, I'm, I, I want I am hot pink. definitely <laughs> going neon, no matter what the, yeah. the color is. Well, yeah. you know, if you're on a series for a long time, they tend to give you the same color all the time. Yeah. I, I think I was pink on you the You were OC. soft pink. No, you were purple. You were purple. I was purple. I was soft you're pink. pink. Because Sorry. if somebody I comes on that. and changes it, it fucks it messes your head. You up. No yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, you were purple. That's right. I was purple. You were. And they gave, they specially, they got me. Special baby bike. pink, like special. But my other <laughs> series, I was always hot. Do you guys remember everybody's color on the you know, Is that weird that I, I remember? Well, because I love purple, so I remember. I was like, oh, Mindy got purple, oh, and then it worked you. in my favor. Uh, hmm. I have a weird visual, like photographic memory. That's the only memory I have. It's photographic. Right. Hmm. I feel like no, I don't know. I could do that <laughs> now. I think M Misha was orange. Hmm. Is that right? I thought she was red. This is really interesting. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> one more question. Hi, everybody. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Melinda. Hi, Logan. It's Tabo here from South Africa. I grew up obsessed with the OC, and I'm absolutely mm -hmm. loving the podcast. Ladies, please keep up the brilliant work. My question for Logan, you know, on season four, we kind of saw everybody's happy ending. You know, um, Julie goes to school. The Coens have a baby. Ryan gets a job. But we never find out what happens with Trey. Um, the last time we see Trey, he's in prison and nearly gets his brother in trouble, if I'm not mistaken. Now, my question for you, Logan, as somebody who portrayed Trey, um, wh what do you imagine his ending being like on the OC? Is it a good one? You know, does he eventually clean up his act? Or does he go in and out of prison? Does he eventually reconcile with Ryan? I'm very curious about that. Um, yeah, I guess that's my question. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm obsessed with South Africa, so thanks for your question. Um, I love South Africa. Um, I that's a great question, mm -hmm. and I think I've been asked it once before. Really? Not not into that depth, not to that um, specificity, but certainly like what happened to Trey. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know the melodramatic actor in me um, <laughs> would say that there's, and maybe there's a good picture for Josh uh, <laughs> that you follow. It's not a comedy. Um, but I definitely think it's a tragedy, unfortunately, for for someone like Trey. And I could see him owing a bookie in Vegas some money, and, you know, um, having to work that off or find uh, make cho even worse choices that pile up. And I don't I don't know if Trey has a long life, a shelf life, unfortunately, on this earth. It doesn't feel like. He had the cards, the right cards dealt to him. And I don't think he knows how to play the cards, unfortunately. Um, so I could see him, you know, I could see him probably being killed, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for owing money to somebody in Vegas. You know, once he's in a bigger pond, you know, uh, high school's one thing, the OC's another. But I think Vegas, is, which is where, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, um, where he ends up, I believe, um, at least last week. He we doesn't see. die. <laughs> well, I'm telling you, he does. <laughs> <laughs> now, now I'm telling you, I'm now I'm telling Josh also he should write that show. But um, no, I don't think we, I don't think we ever know. 
yeah. I guess. And um, but it's a great question. I don't I don't know if he has a long shelf life. I, I feel like he's. You know, he, he kept saying to Ryan when Ryan would uh, confront him, he was like, what do you want me to say? I screwed up. Like he says that time and time and time again. I know I screwed up. I know I screwed up. But if he's accepted the fact that he's cursed, this is just who I am. I'm cursed. So I think people get tend to whatever they put out into the world is what comes back to them. And no, if no. he's putting that kind of energy out, then he's, he becomes a tragedy. Well, you know, there's something if you if you listen to that final fight um, and something in all of his um, bad boy moments, uh, there's a little bit of joy. Um, like he loves that pool fight. You know, I remember in the beginning. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. With Chris Backus. That's one thing I remember. Chris Backus was uh, mm -hmm. in that pool in the first episode, I think, um, who, is, who also I would become friends with. He's a great guy. Um, but there's also, there's just that, a little bit of love of getting entangled right. in, in bad choices. And, and if you listen, there's even some laughter. Like, he just loves that we're going there. He and yeah. his brother are going there. He gets um, off on, like, the adrenaline. It's very stimulating. Yeah. I think it's that. it's a idiosyncratic. Um, I didn't want to twist a mustache on it. But, you know, um, it's just something I think that he can't help it. Mm -hmm. He just kind of loves the uh, the bad choices. Yeah. And just... And just sits in and marinates in it you know but you said something earlier which i think is really true about just luck you know like ryan was lucky and trey was unlucky i do think in life there is an element of that i agree people and situations i mean you know the yeah. older you get you're like oh well, i was really unlucky or, oh fuck like you know but then you could also argue that he was lucky enough to have ryan and then he, he's actually presented with with this world of Look at all these people. We're here for you. We're here to support you. You got a job. You're, but he. But then you have this character of Jess that just pulls him into this dark side, or he can't help himself anymore. Yeah, I think it's all it's all of the above. You know. Yeah. It's uh, your hereditary, your genes, your environment, mm -hmm. and it's got to be a little bit of luck. I think you know. I'm not, I am somewhat of a determinist, but luck, I think, would throw that out the window. Um, and I definitely believe in in luck. I better. I'm an actor. And, I, yeah. and, I've been, and I've been very lucky to only have to be an actor. And right. I know what right. luck is in this business. Yeah. And a lot of luck is, as a, that saying on the wrestling wall, is preparation and timing. You know, preparation meets opportunity. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's what luck is. That's you know? what it says on wrestling walls. It's what you say on our wrestling wall. <laughs> okay. Is luck. There's no such luck is preparation plus timing. Yeah. That's what that's what right. it is in luck. Is. I like that. You are very prepared. <laughs> <laughs> How's your timing? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to let go of the control. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, Logan. This has been such a treat and a pleasure to see you again and, and to just hang out in the pool house and talk about something that we all collectively went through together mm -hmm. many years ago. And just, you know, thank you so much. And I know the fans really appreciate you coming on. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's been rad, man. No, thank you. <laughs> right Back Hatch has been therapeutic, uh, cathartic, and, right. and um, eye-opening. <laughs> it's, it's been nice to have a reason to go back and revisit um, a show I hadn't really seen, so. Yeah. Right. Well, you should watch your whole performance, because it's really, I mean, I don't know, maybe yeah. you're not like one that like, <laughs> like, I made it to watch myself. You um, know, we could end with watching Dear Sister. That, you know what, that's what I want to see. I kind of want to see it. Okay. Yeah. Well, I love every single person involved in it, yeah. as an that artist, means, yes. you know, and. Um, a very talented group of. Uh, I, I was, there. I was definitely more honored than. You know, but oh, it certainly totally. it gave me some insecurities. Yeah. I don't know if I was, a, well, I was just too young. And, and it's all, the highest form you know, of flattery. No doubt. I did not understand it. She still asking. She's like, I don't get this. <laughs> I don't get the skin. Oh, I got it. And <laughs> and that's what made it so hurt so much and be so, so fun. Hey, man. What you doing? Nothing. Just uh, writing a letter to my sister. <laughs> cool. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. I, uh, I haven't seen her in years. It's uh. <laughs> It's weird because you 
And we just found out that was a Logan choice. <laughs> oh, the look, yeah. The look. <laughs> If nothing else, to be a part of the yeah. inspiration for that. I mean, what an all-star I mean, group, too. For sure. Oh, my God, it kills me. I'm honored. Wow. On that note. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, is I'm going to walk around the rest of the day just being like, mm, what you yeah. say? See, I like that remix a lot, too. Right. I know Josh said there was another one. But yeah. That one kind of kicked ass as well. Yeah. I'm still thinking about how you do that in karaoke. Are you literally up there like, mm, but <laughs> again, I don't. And then you're like, da, 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 da. I, at the beginning of the song is what I, it always escapes me because it just doesn't sound like the rest of the song. Oh, right. right. It starts you know? out. It's like, where are we? Yeah. I'm but I think it's big yeah. enough. Karaoke will grab anything that's big enough. Yeah. So. Well, everyone. <sighs> this has been an adventure. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for listening. Please follow, rate, and review Welcome to the OC Bitches wherever you listen to your podcast. And if you'd like to watch us, and I think you should on this one, you better check it out on YouTube. Bye, Bye. bitches. Bye, y'all. <laughs>